Hey, Diane, what kind of day is it? It's a new day. It is a new day, and it's a great one because we're back, both of us, we're at full strength today. So <laughs> I, was, I was reading this story about a, a mental institution, and a, there was a group taking a tour of it. Okay. And one woman asked the director if there was a criteria to know if someone should be institutionalized there. And the director said, yes, we have a test. And here's the test. He said, I fill a tub with water, bathtub with water, and then I set out a bucket, a cup, and a teaspoon. And I ask the person to drain the bathtub, empty the bathtub. And she kind of smiled and said, oh, yeah, I suppose a normal person would use the bucket because it's bigger. And he said, no, a normal person would open the drain. Would you like a room with a window? <laughs> well, we're, we're finishing our series on learning how to fight mm -hmm. uh, the Jesus way. And sometimes some of Jesus' teachings can seem a little bit insane. And uh, today we're going to talk about the hardest part of that, and that's about mercy. Okay. Um, you know, we have this really weird understanding that justice is about getting even. You know, there's a story about a mom was going to bed and, and all of a sudden from the kid's bedroom, she hears her five-year-old son screaming. So she goes running in to find that his two-year-old sister had taken a handful of his hair and was yanking on it. And she went over and sort of gently peeled her Keep hand the yeah, yeah. off and, and, explained, that. Yeah, <laughs> and explained to her little boy, you know, it, it, she just doesn't understand that that hurts. And the little boy is getting over his tears and he's nodding, you know, and she gets him calmed down and puts him back into bed. And then she's walking back to her room and all of a sudden she hears the little girl screaming. And she goes running back. She says, what happened? And the little boy looked at her and says, she knows it hurts now. <laughs> <laughs> well, getting even is not justice, <laughs> and uh, we'll find out what Jesus has to say about that. Okay. All right, you ready? I am. All right, let's get to it. When my brother was very young, I'm talking about eight, nine, ten, and a little older, he was obsessed with chess. He loved playing chess. He carried a board around. Any chance he'd get to play chess with someone, he'd take it. He carried around his little Bobby Fischer book, you know, and Bobby Fischer, Grand Master Champion, and set up all the moves and look at all the strategies. He loved playing chess. But unfortunately, sometimes he had difficulty finding someone to play chess against. So, um, you know, if, if we lived, you know, many places we lived out in the country, there weren't a lot of neighbors and lot of, not a lot of kids our age around. So my brother would be forced to look around to see who would play chess. And here was his older sister and his younger sister. Well, his younger sister did not know anything about chess, didn't know how to play, but his older sister had a basic understanding of how the pieces moved, the objective, what you could and couldn't do. So he'd always ask, come on, my, uh, our older sister, play chess, play chess. So she would play chess with him. And they would play, and he would annihilate her every single game. Ten moves or less sometimes four moves. He always just beat her so badly to the point where my sister did not want to play him anymore. So if my brother wanted to uh, win as many chess games as possible, he was successful. But if my brother wanted to play against a worthy opponent, and by that way, become better and more experienced and become a better chess player, he failed completely. My sister was having none of the playing chess anymore. So as a last resort, he looked to his younger sister. And he had to teach her how to play from the ground up. What every piece moved, how the board was set up, strategies, what you could do, what you couldn't do. You know, I learned, you know, when I was nine, you can't just randomly adjust pieces on the board without saying, je dub, or I adjust, you know, all the different things he had to do. All this time of teaching me, he could have been getting better, and my sister could have been getting better too, if my brother had just shown a little mercy in playing games of chess with her. 
If he had been a little kinder about showing um, maybe strategies she could use instead of just wanting to beat her as few mews every time, he could have gotten better, she could have gotten better, and he could have had a worthy opponent instead of me, who didn't know anything. Well, in life, sometimes we forget it isn't a game where one person can win and everyone else can lose. That's not the point. We need to play, we need to live our life in a way where everybody gets to say that they win. And we do that by offering mercy and by offering kindness when we play. And when we do that, everybody wins. Our scripture today comes from the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel. Matthew, or Jesus is teaching a parable about how we can relate to others when we're owed something. Let's listen for God's word. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before the master and begged him, Please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until he could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called the man who had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he paid the entire debt. That is what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. May God bless us with understanding for these words. So there's an old fable called, Who Killed the Otter's Children? And it goes a little bit like this. One day, the otter came to the deer mouse and asked the deer mouse, Would you watch my children while I go down to the stream to catch some fish? And the deer mouse said, Well, of course I will, and the otter left. Later in the day, she came back with a large stringer of fish and discovered that her children were dead. They'd been trampled. And she went to the deer mouse and said, What happened? And the deer mouse said, I'm so sorry, but I couldn't help it. The woodpecker came and began to beat the, the war drum, and I'm in charge of the war dance, and so I had to begin to dance. And in the process of the dance, your children were trampled to death. Well, the otter said, I'm going to King Solomon, and I'm going to tell him what happened, and you're going to be punished. And so off to King Solomon she went. And when she got there, she began to explain that the deer mouse had killed her children. And King Solomon called for the deer mouse, and the deer mouse came before him, and he said, Did you kill the otter's children? And the deer mouse said, Your Highness, yes, but it wasn't my fault. You know I'm the keeper, the main dancer of the war dance, and I had to dance. King asked why, and she said, Because the woodpecker came and began beating on the war drum. So King Solomon called the woodpecker and asked the woodpecker, were you beating on the war drum? And the woodpecker says, you know I'm the main beater of the war drum, and I had to. And Solomon asked him why, and he said, well, because the great lizard came and he was wearing his sword. So the great lizard was called in, and King Solomon said, were you wearing the sword? And the great lizard said, you know I'm the keeper of the sword, and I had to put it on. He said, why? He said, because I saw the tortoise wearing his armor. And so the tortoise was called in, and the king asked, were you wearing your armor? And the tortoise said, yes, your highness, but I had to. And he asked why, and he said, because I saw the king crab trailing his three-sided uh, pike and so the 
Um, the, the king crab was called in and the king asked him, were you trailing your three-sided pike? And the king crab said, yes, your highness, but I had to because I saw the crayfish shouldering his lance. And so the crayfish was brought in and King Solomon asked, were you shouldering your lance? And the crayfish said, yes, your highness, but I had to. And King Solomon asked him why, and he said, because I saw the otter coming to kill my children. So who's responsible for the death of the otter's children? Fighting is a lot like that. It becomes kind of a vicious cycle. And it's because we have this kind of perverted understanding of what justice is. What we call justice usually turns out to be, I want to get even. You ever watch when somebody cuts in line and then the person they cut in front of, they have to get around them and it becomes especially dangerous if you see it on the highway. Somebody cuts off another driver and then they zoom around to get ahead and, and it goes back and forth until it becomes full-blown road rage. Because somehow, justice means we have to get even. But here's what Jesus was saying. Mercy stops the cycle. And the question is, how do we get to that? Well, to do that, we have to look at the parable that Jesus told. It's about a guy who owed the king a lot of money. The king had decided it had come time to settle the accounts. And, and if you read a more traditional translation, it says he owed 10,000 talents. So he's called someone to come and see the king. And you can imagine if you owe a big debt to someone and all of a sudden you've been summoned to their place, you know what the summons for. So he's got to come across the territory and head into the palace, the throne room. And, and if you think of a throne room like a, 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 a courthouse, have you ever noticed that, that especially in old time in smaller towns, courthouses were always high up. They're built on a hill sometimes, or if there wasn't a hill, sometimes they built a hill in order to put the courthouse on top of it. And why? So there'd be that long flight of concrete stairs that you had to climb up because if you're going to the seat of power, you're going to have to climb to get there. So here comes this guy to the courthouse and he sees he's got this long flight of concrete steps that he's got to climb up and then he gets to the doors, you know, and, and the doors into the courtroom are always those great big high double doors. Usually they're made out of thick pieces of, of some kind of really hard heavy wood like oak and, and there's people there and they open the doors and he comes in kind of trepidly and he marches to the front and he's standing there and, and then the king comes in from the side and sits down at the desk and he's standing there bowing to the king and, and then a servant comes in with this huge leather bound ledger plops it down in front of the king and he begins to open it and he starts to page through until he finds the page with your name in the top left corner and he begins to study the page and he looks up and he says you owe me some money and you say, yes, sir. He says, you owe me a lot of money. And you say, yes, sir. And he says, I want my money. And you say, yes, sir. And then he says, but I want my money now. And you say, yes, uh, well, I don't have that kind of money. And the king pulls in his assistants, and you go overhear them. They're talking about going in and selling all your stuff, putting you in prison, selling your wife, your children into slavery. Imagine having to go home and have that conversation with your wife. Um, honey, remember that money we borrowed to start that business that failed? Remember that? The, the king wants it back, and we don't have the money. And, and he says, I'm going to have to go to jail, and, and it's worse than that. They're selling all our stuff, and it's, it's worse than that. They're going to sell you and the kids into slavery. Imagine trying to have that conversation. So the king looks up from his discussion, and he's fallen down. The man's fallen down on his knees, and he's beginning to plead and beg, 
please, your highness, just give me some more time. I know I can pay it all back if you'll just give me enough. And the tears are flowing and he's begging for more time. And, and, and the king looks down at him. They're pleading and he sees the tears and he's moved in compassion. And all of a sudden he says, I'll do even better than that. I'll wipe out your debt. Imagine how you'd feel. Your debt's been forgiven. Oh my gosh, that heavy weight in the pit of your stomach that you've been dealing with ever since you got word the king wanted to see you, that you've trudged all the way across the territory and carried all, all that heaviness is gone and you'd float. I mean, you wouldn't have to walk out of the room. You just float out of the room and you come and, and it's down to the, you float down to the bottom of the stairs, wouldn't you? Well, that's not the way the story went. That guy must have trudged down the hall, out the door, hit every step on the way down because when he got to the bottom of the steps, he sees a guy who owes him a little bit of money. He grabs him by the throat and says, pay me what you owe me. And the guy just does the same thing he'd just done. He gets down on his knees and he begins pleading, please, if you'll give me more time, I'll pay it back. I don't have the money right now, but if you'll just give me a little more time, I'll pay it back. Only this time he wasn't forgiving. Called the police in. Said he owes me money. He won't pay. Have him thrown in prison till he can pay me the entire debt. Well, some people knew what had happened the first situation. Saw how he responded. They went in and told the king. King says, you better bring him back. We need to have another conversation. The word goes out. You have to travel across the territory, up the steps, through the big double doors in front of the king. And the king says, you wicked servant. You know that cell you had your other friend put into? Well, that's a suite. It's big enough for two. And I'm selling all your stuff, and I'm selling your wife and your children into slavery until you can pay the whole thing back. Well, when I first read this story, you know, as I'm sitting in my Sunday school class, I'm thinking, oh, the king's kind of the hero here, right? I mean, he owes this big debt, and he forgives the whole thing. And I want to make him the hero, but, but he's not. Because my understanding of forgiveness is, once you give it, you can't take it back. I mean, there might be a case to be made if the man had hurt the king again, but he didn't do that didn't have any effect on the king. So what's going on here? Well, first you have to realize that this is not an allegory. This is a parable. And the point is not who's the hero, but what's the message? So if you read the traditional, it says that he owed the king 10,000 talents. Now I looked that up. In Jesus' time, that would have been about $10 million. That's a lot of money. I mean, today, it maybe doesn't seem like that much because there are, are sports figures who make that much in a year. And, and so I'm trying to figure out how can we relate to that. So I looked it up today. Back in Jesus' day, the Roman Empire on an average year collected what in today's terms would be about $850,000. And the largest country in the world, the largest empire in the world, could function the whole government on $850,000 a year. And this guy owes $10 million. Jesus was telling a joke. I looked up this morning. You know what the, the average federal um, budget is for the United States these days? It's just under $5 trillion. So given all these figures, it would be like Jesus coming in today and said, well, there was this guy who owed $55 trillion. Nobody can get in debt that far. I mean, that's one-eighth of the world's entire world's wealth. Nobody could get in debt that far. And he goes down and it says, he finds a guy, and this guy owes him a hundred denarii. Now, a denarii was a day's wage. So he owed about a quarter of a year's salary. You know how much that was back then? A year's salary was 80 bucks. The guy owed him 20 bucks. 
you want to look at it in today's terms, I looked this statistic up too. The average wage earner in the United States today makes just under $52,000. Okay, so it'd be like owing oh, about twelve grand. So, here's the story as Jesus is telling it. There's this guy who owes $55 trillion and the king forgives the debt and he gets to the bottom of the steps and he tells the guy, you owe me 12 grand. What? You owe me 12 grand? Why would he do that? How do you figure that? Imagine this. One day, you and your coworker Joe decide to go out and have lunch together. You know, you're just going to go out for a fast food meal. You know, McDonald's, Burger King, Arby's, I don't know, Chipotle, whatever. Whatever your thing is. And so you get to the fast food restaurant and you step up the counter and you place your order. And then your friend comes up behind you and starts doing this, you know. Oh, crap, I left my wallet in my jacket. Look, if you'll get my lunch, I'll pay you back tomorrow morning, okay? So you agree, you know, and your friend gets up and he orders lunch and, and you figure it up. Your friend owes you $7.29, all right? Well, that night on the way home, you got to stop and get gas. And you decide you're kind of thirsty, so you're going to go in and buy a soda. And while you're there, you decide, ah, what the heck? Powerball's up to $200 million. What's well, two bucks? So you buy yourself a Powerball ticket throw it in the console in your car, drink your soda, drive home. You get up the next morning, and the news is all out there. Somebody in your town won the Powerball. So what do you do? You go out to the car, you get in the center console, you pull out your ticket, and you check the number, and lo and behold, you're holding the winning ticket. Now the Powerball, at least as I was getting ready for today, it's Thursday, was $199 million. That was the estimate. I'm going to round it to $200 million, right? So that's over a 30-year period, but say you only want the one-time payment, which is about 70%, so you get about $140, $145 million. Out of that, you got to pay federal taxes. That's going to be 40 to 45. So let's say you wind up after taxes and everything, you're going to get a check for $100 million. What are you thinking about? I'm thinking about, ooh, the house I'm going to build, the cars I'm going to buy, the vacations I'm going to take, the friends and relatives I'm going to avoid for the next 10 years. You know what I mean? You know what I'm not going to think about? My coworker who owes me $7.29 from yesterday's lunch. I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, I'll get my phone out. Maybe I'll send him a text, remind him, when you come to work today, be sure you bring that $7.29 you owe me. Who's thinking about that when you got $100 million coming your way? What's $7.29? There's something else going on here. And I think it has something to do with our kind of perverted sense of justice and fairness. We always think that somehow we can work our way into getting what we need, and especially true with God. You know, if I do a funeral for somebody I have never met, they call me from the funeral home, first thing I hear from the family, oh, he was a good person, she did a lot of good in the community. And I hear all the stories about how good they are, even though... Obviously, since they called me, they don't have a church home. But they were a good person. Like, if we are good enough, we can earn our way into God's kingdom. Jesus is trying to say that's not how it works. But we have this perverted sense. You know, and, and, and it even rolls around to where it's, it's hard to even accept gifts from one another. You know, if you're a Big Bang Theory uh, watcher, if you were, one of Sheldon Cooper's main things was that a gift wasn't just a gift, but it had came with an implied contract. Remember, he didn't want to celebrate birthdays or holidays because if somebody gave you a gift, it meant you owed them something back. And he used the example in one that if somebody gives you $50 on your birthday, then you're responsible for giving them $50 on their birthday, and it just goes back and forth, and the only one who wins is the one who dies last except that's not what gift-giving is about. 
people we do that way. You know, we can't even take compliments very well. Somebody comes up, you know, and says, wow, you really look nice today. Oh, this old shirt? <laughs> I got this on sale. It's old. You know, we have a terrible time because, at least when I was in Sunday school, you never want to be in debt to somebody else. You know, don't ever take candy from a stranger, but even more important, don't take candy from a friend. Because if you do, you owe them something. And because we think everything has to be even, we don't know how to give gifts. And even more important, we don't know how to receive gifts. What's going on with this story? Man comes into the throne room. And he owes an exorbitant amount. And, and Jesus was just telling us, you can almost imagine the crowd laughing when he gave the amount. He owes $55 trillion. <laughs> Nobody could borrow that kind of money. And the king says, I'm going to show you more mercy than you're even asking. I'm going to forgive your debt. And why did he walk out of that room? And why did he walk down and hit every step and accost the other person at the bottom of the steps? Because he never heard the king. He was so tied up in our understanding of what it means to have justice and be even. He begged for more time. And that's what he heard. The king was giving him more time. He thought he still owed the debt. And while $12,000 isn't much compared to $55 trillion, it's more than he had. And he was desperate. He knew he could never raise it, but he was desperate to get everything he can. And isn't that what happens with us sometimes? We get so desperate to earn our way into God's good graces that we can't see anything else. And we wind up fighting with the people that we love the most. And what Jesus was trying to say is, God is merciful. We don't earn it. There isn't anything we can do to earn God's love and mercy and forgiveness. The only thing we can do is accept it. And we won't be able to accept it until we get rid of the concept that justice is about everything being even or equal because it never will be if we can learn to accept forgiveness we'll be able to give mercy and when we can give mercy the fighting will stop because we don't have to get even anymore you know what happens if we can learn to accept forgiveness and mercy Nobody's going to have to tell us how to live. Nobody's going to have to help tell you to help your neighbor or feed the hungry or even love your enemy because it will just come out of the joy you have from knowing how good and how loving our God is. Let's pray. God, as we come here today, we thank you for the mercy, even though oftentimes we try to earn our way into your good graces. Help us to remember that you can't earn grace. That the forgiveness we have comes not from what we've done or what we've earned, but from who you are and how much you love us. God, keep loving us until we can truly receive it. And when we do, may it so fill us that it changes us that we can live the way your son taught us every single day. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'm going to invite you, as we always do, to join us in our New Day Creed. Will you say it together with me? It's not about me. I give myself freely and totally to God that I may be used for the building of God's kingdom, for the care of God's world, to love God's children, all of God's children, even those who are not like me, even those who do not like me that God's kingdom might become real and I might be blessed and be made complete. Friends, you've been given great mercy. You've been forgiven. No matter what you've done, God still loves you just the way you are. So 
what I hope is you can go out and live that love every day until we can be together again. May God's blessing be with you. Amen.